1978, I was nine years old. I lived in Bellingham, Washington, a small city about an hour and a half north of Seattle. My parents were the carefree hippie types and pretty much let me roam the streets and visit friends as long as I was home by dark. It was a late summer and I took a bus across town to visit my friend Leslie. We would go buy candy at the corner store and walk to Fred Meyer, a Target type of store, to watch TV in the electronics section. My parents didn't let me watch much TV, so I could spend a whole day at Fred Meyer watching whatever I wanted. It was great. It got to be late afternoon, so Leslie and I parted ways. I walked to the bus stop downtown. As I was waiting, a white car slowly drove by, and just the way the driver looked at me made me start to shake. I watched him turn the corner. Instinctively, I knew that he was going around the block following me, and he did. This time he parked across the street. He got out and asked me if I wanted a ride. I remember everything about him. Curly dark hair, thick mustache, and the feeling I got from him was nothing I'd ever felt before. He pretty much paced up and down the block, smiling as he walked, repeatedly offering me a ride. He then walked back to his car and was talking on some kind of CB or walkie-talkie or something. He was talking to someone about me. I could tell by the way he was nodding and smiling at me. He approached one more time about a ride and this time I yelled no. Thankfully the bus came, but I knew he would follow the bus. I went to the back of the bus and watched from the back window. He waited behind the bus at every stop. My stop was on a corner. I got off and ran as fast as I could. I looked back once and could see the back of his car. He had parked, obviously. Then I ran another half block and crouched down behind a tree and bush. I could see him standing on the corner just staring down the street. After a few minutes, he finally left. Fast forward to January of 1979. A news story came on. Two college women had been murdered by Kenneth Bianchi. It was him. His face was all over the news for a while. Only later in life did I find out that he and his cousin were the Hillside Stranglers. They murdered girls and women in L.A. Then Bianchi moved up to Bellingham in the summer of 1978, and I also learned that he had worked at Fred Meyer. The strange part is, Bianchi moved to Bellingham without his cousin. So who was he talking to that day he tried to get me? In his car. This happened a long time ago, I'm guessing back in 2006, and I couldn't have been older than four years old at the time, yet I vividly remember the fear I felt during this encounter. It was an early summer morning and the sun was up, but few people were out. In fact, the streets were practically dead that morning. My mom decided to take my sister, only one-year-old, seated in a stroller, and I to throw away some garbage at a garbage station. I might add that the garbage station is kind of secluded from nearby houses, bordering one of these deep, dark forests of eastern Sweden. Since I was only four years old when this happened, the memories from the incident have faded a lot. However, my mom remembers all of it. She says that upon entering the garbage station, she immediately got an eerie feeling of being watched. I remember that feeling too. I felt creeped out, even though I didn't know why I was scared. I guess I could sense my mom's fear. Walking along that secluded garbage station, my mom suddenly stopped and told me, saying my name, hold on to the stroller as hard as you can and don't let go, no matter what. That's my most vivid memory I have of this and I don't think I'll ever forget those words. I'll at least never forget how they made me feel. It was as if my blood turned to ice. I just froze. My mom sounded stern, but even a toddler can sense when someone's scared out of their mind. My mom was definitely afraid of something. The rest is just a blur. I don't remember much apart from the aforementioned, so I'll let the rest of the story be told from the perspective of my mother. This is the recollection of her experience recalled to the best of my abilities, but not my own words. Not far from where we were standing, a truck was parked with a man seated in the front, Nothing unusual, 
A lot of truck drivers stopped to rest by the side of the road, but this man was staring, and he wouldn't stop. He stared right at me, examining my body with the determined gaze of a predator. Gluing the three of us in his sight, he truly seemed pleased by the fear he'd instilled in our faces. In his eyes, there was something else, almost as if they didn't belong to a human, but rather some sort of creature on the savannah. I felt like prey stuck in the claws of a lion, and I just couldn't move. Then when he smiled at me, I remembered that dead smile, those cold, calculating eyes, the way he licked his lips, almost as if to say, I could kill you if I wanted to. I believe this was the point in time, into the strange encounter, when my mom told me to hold on to the stroller, to hold on tightly and not let go. My mom was a small woman, 160 centimeters, weighing only about 45 kilos, which is about 5 foot 100 pounds, and she could easily have been overpowered by the overweight man in the truck. My mom later admitted she was afraid he'd jump out of the truck and knock her out, possibly assaulting her or even kidnapping me or my one-year-old sister. We bolted out of there and didn't throw away much garbage that morning. We just turned around and walked home as fast as a mom can do with a stroller and a four-year-old toddler by her side. We've never talked about what happened that day, and up until very recently. That incident has always lingered somewhere in the back of my mind as that weird thing that happened when I was a child. And every time I walk past that garbage station, I get a weird feeling in the pit of my stomach. As previously mentioned, this happened around 2006. Fast forward to 2008. The face of a 10-year-old little girl called Angla was printed across the front page of every newspaper in sight. She had been abducted, assaulted, and murdered, and the perpetrator was an overweight truck driver named Anders Eklund, now known as one of Sweden's most infamous killers. Anders Eklund was charged with the murder of Engla, alongside the assault and murder of a woman named Pernilla. He's also suspected of abducting another little girl who's still missing, making him a predator of young children a serial assaultist, and a murderer. My mom says that when she saw Eklund's picture in the paper, especially when she saw those cold, familiar eyes, she knew he was the man from the garbage station that early morning all those years ago. Thinking how my mom, or my sister, or me, or all of us could have been victims, it sends chills up my spine. Anders, even though you're behind bars now, I pray to God I never have to see your eyes again. I was maybe 16 years old and I was kind of a rebellious kid. I joined Tinder to meet some older guys and matched with this really attractive 20 year old that seemed really into me. Naive, I know. Anyway. He asked to pick me up from school the following day to get ice cream and walk around a nearby lake. Of course I said yes. He picked me up and we had a great conversation. Nothing weird and it seemed like we really enjoyed each other's company. When we got to the lake no one was there because it was the middle of October and it was cold on the water. We walked about halfway around the lake and that's when it got weird. He started talking to me about crime documentaries and how he'd studied them and know how to kill someone without getting caught. He started making tracks in the mud and said that he would want to wear big shoes too so the police couldn't match him on shoe size. He picked up his shoe to show me that he was a 10.5 size and informed me that he wore an 8. I immediately got uneasy. He was strolling around me while I was sitting on the bench like I was prey. He went to one of those dog baggy dispensers and pulled one off. He sheathed it up to his elbow and started swatting it in my face. I thought he might be trying to gross me out so I was half giggling and swatting it away. On one of my swats he grabbed my forearm and pulled me in and pulled the bag over my head. Still I thought he might be kidding but as I tried to get away I noticed that he wasn't letting up. I was starting to panic now realizing that I wasn't getting any air, and he picked me up in a sort of headlock position. 
I was kicking and trying to elbow and I guess one of those elbows connected to his groin and we both fell to the ground. He laughed and said, You got more fight in you than I thought you did. I was just going to make you pass out but I didn't even get that far. I'm proud of you. All of my stuff, my phone, taser, etc. was in his car on the other side of the lake so I decided to play along and pretend that it was just a joke. I told him I needed my inhaler now and to walk me back. He did, surprisingly. I got in his car and grabbed my taser and my phone out. While he walked around the back of the car to his driver's side, I texted my mom SOS and to track my location. When I looked up from my phone, I noticed the guy had pulled out a pocket knife. He slowly laid the tip into my chest, just enough for it to almost pierce my skin. He just blankly stared at me and this went on for about 30 full seconds. I don't know why, but I said, You're not going to do it. This seemed to snap him out of it, and he paused and hysterically laughed. Between laughs, he got out. That's the second time I could have killed you today. <laughs> the whole drive home, he proceeded to tell me how he would have had his way with me and mutilated my body if I had accidentally died that day. I got home and bolted out of his car. As soon as I did, he sped off. He then sent disgusting pictures of himself later that night, and then he blocked me. I stalked him on social media and looked him up, and he was actually 27 years old and did have a criminal record for domestic violence. That's all I could get of him, though. I even gone as far as to report it to the police, but nothing came of it, though probably because I wasn't willing to tell my parents what had happened. Either way, it was the worst encounter of my life, and I will never ever again be that naive. So I'm in my early 20s and female. I moved out on my own for the first time about two years ago. I haven't had much to do with any of my neighbors and I've always been slightly uneasy to the fact that no one around here is looking out for me. If anything seems off, no one would notice or do any investigating to make sure I'm alright. Last year I noticed a man constantly walking his dog in the grass area behind my home. This isn't unusual to see, it is a common area for residents here. His dog is super cute and my cat liked to play with it through the glass door out back. They would just chase each other back and forth and put their paws up to the glass and such. It was real cute stuff. Well, one day I was outside and his dog came running up to my porch with glee to get pets and say hi to his kitty friend. This is the first time I actually spoke to this neighbor. We'll call him Mark. So, Mark seemed decent enough and we got along just fine. We started hanging out pretty often in a short time period because I'm a smoker and he was letting his dog out all the time and it was summer so we ran into each other quite often and would spend an hour or more after work most days talking. This lasted for a couple of weeks. I gave him my phone number and was happy to have a friend in my complex. I will say, he was clearly very interested in either having a romantic relationship with me or at least being butt buddies. He said this quite often, not butt buddies but you get what I'm saying and I was very honest with him that I wasn't interested in either at all and had to tell him this quite often. Frankly, I was getting rather irritated that this came up several times every time we spoke. He rather quickly was trying to get me in his house, from the first time we talked until the last. He offered multiple times every time I saw him. I always said no and blamed it on being sort of COVID cautious, so to speak. He quickly got tired of that excuse and invited himself into my home as well. I always said no. One day he came out while I was smoking with a bottle of wine and a couple of glasses, saying I had to try this stuff because it's delicious. I instantly noticed that the seal was broken on the screw bottle cap, but doesn't seem like anything was drank. The bottle was filled to the brim, which I also thought was a little odd because usually wine isn't filled to the tippy top like that. So he pours us a couple of drinks and doesn't drop a beat in telling me to take a drink. I felt very uncomfortable. 
but didn't want him to feel like he was being accused of anything when he's just trying to be a nice friendly neighbor. After all, he poured himself a glass of this very same stuff, right? Well, my mama still raised me better than that, so I totally faked a sip and said it was good. After any sentence either of us said, he would again tell me to take a drink. I told him I don't really drink, so I'm pacing myself, but did say that I noticed that he hadn't drank any and to please go ahead. He didn't reach for his glass right away, but in the middle of speaking, he reached for his cup and knocked it over, spilling the wine into the grass. He brushed it off rather quickly and told me, it's my turn to drink now. I said, but you still haven't drank anything. You spilled your drink. Pour yourself another glass. I don't want to drink alone. And so we did. He still didn't drink anything. He did tell me a few moments later to drink mine. I told him that he needs to catch up, and we basically just kept doing that in circles. He reached for his glass again, and guess what? He spills it again. Wine is all in the grass now. Then he told me to drink. At this point, I'm done. Too many red flags are literally screaming at me to get out. I'm honest with him. That this seemed really sketchy and I didn't trust the drink because he's refusing to drink any but is way too eager for me to drink mine. He told me he was just clumsy, taking it slow because he doesn't drink a lot, but he has seen me have friends over taking shots and drinking beers and wine, so he knows I'll handle it better than him. Yet another red flag is raised. So he's been watching me? Huh. I think it's important to mention that our complex is huge. He used to work here and knows the maintenance crew and he doesn't live particularly near me. He's about half a block away from me and cannot see my windows or yard from where he lives and has a few different common area yards closer to him that he could use for his dog. So I told him I'm flat out not drinking anything because of how this all seemed. He once again pours himself a glass and once again spills it. There isn't much left in the bottle at this point. I pour the remaining wine in his glass and tell him to drink with me on three. We raise our glasses, and to my amazement he actually takes a drink, and I just spilled mine into the grass. Whoops. He comes out about two nights later while I was smoking and instantly starts complaining to me that I wouldn't date him or hook up with him and he doesn't know why all girls are like this. He starts getting really loud, shouting at me, asking me what the problem with him was, that I won't do these things. I told him that I've been honest with him since I met him and that I'm not interested, and that it isn't him specifically, I'm just honestly not interested in that from anyone right now. He still shouted at me and started complaining about his ex and her dog. Yeah, her dog. Then proceeded to tell me that he used to abuse that dog, and went into really graphic detail about how he wouldn't feed or water it because it used the bathroom in the house and how he would kick it really hard. And I'm horrified at this point. I'm sorry if I triggered anyone by mentioning that, but it was just so terrifying, especially considering this whole time he's telling me this as he's playing fetch with his little dog. His dog always seemed scared of him, and I had even pointed that out in the past, and he said that his dog's previous owners were abusive, so he's just very scared and distrusting. The dog was always very excited to see me though and would cuddle up with me and stay by me so I always thought that I was extra special but with that knowledge I just think the poor guy is currently in an abusive household. I was so done with this dude that I just cut him off and said I needed to go because my friends were waiting on me. He has sent me several messages of gibberish when he's outside. He'll just blow my phone up with Hey, Hi, Jeheba, Nisahabada, Jehek. Law, my name, hi, could you get? It's just all nonsense like that and we'll keep going. He has texted me telling me that he knows I'm home because he has seen me walking around or that he sees my car in the lot. He'll throw his dog toys on my porch. I think he tries to get my attention to come out because of the cute dog and he will just stand outside my porch for hours. It's all cold and rainy and snowy these days so it's even creepier. I think in his mind, since I'm a smoker, he thinks I'll come out eventually Silly him, though, because I just go out front when I see him out there. He said several things to me before the wine fiasco went down that were already red flags. I figured it might be a language or cultural difference, though, because English is the third language he's learned and America is the third country he's lived in. 
I guess moral of the story is to just trust your gut. He still is bothering me, and like I said, we only spoke and hung out for a few weeks in the summer of 2020. My last message from him was last night. He asked me what he had done wrong and if I felt disrespected in any way. I have not spoken to him since he screamed at me for not hooking up with him, sandwiched with admitting horrible animal abuse. I thought about answering his text with the brutal truth about how twisted and creepy he presented himself as and how uncomfortable he made me feel, but I didn't want to give him any ideas on how he should improve. Stay smart, folks. Don't drink things people give you if the seal is broken. He was definitely trying to drug me. When I was a child, around 10 years old, female, my parents ran a construction business. They had several employees on the payroll at any given time, mostly to drive gravel and cement trucks for them. My dad is a kind but naive man who often hires friends of friends who are down on their luck to give them a chance to get back on their feet. It never worked out well, because my dad somehow always gets linked up with the scrungiest people. They had a lot of creeps over the years, but I think the worst one might have been Ben. Ben was a friend of my dad's dad, who also worked for us. Ben supposedly had an old work injury that made it difficult for him to work any job where he had to be on his feet all day. My dad's dad begged my dad to give him a job as a driver, and my dad finally agreed. From the day she met him, Ben made my mom extremely uncomfortable. He just had one of those weird vibes that you can't explain, and everyone but my dad picked up on it. Like I said, my dad is extremely naive. My mom wouldn't let me and my younger sister around him for any length of time. We were homeschooled at the time, and my mom worked in the office, so we were around quite a bit. She kept telling my dad that we should let him go, but my dad wouldn't because he said that he didn't have any legitimate reason to fire him. And this is the weird part. Whenever my sister and I were at the office on a slow day, my dad's dad would always try to get us to come over and sit with him and Ben. He would always ask, don't you want to go for a ride with us in the big truck? Ben himself wouldn't talk to us. He let my dad's dad handle that. We were shy kids, so we never agreed to, but he was so persistent. They reached a point where it was literally every single time he saw us there. My sister and I would take turns hiding in the bathroom so we didn't have to be around them. They'd always do it when my mom was out of the room, and they'd back off whenever she was around. My dad was never around when it happened, and I don't think he believed it. I mean, who wants to believe that? My mom eventually had enough and told my dad that Ben had to go. A few years later, we found out that Ben had taken a young girl. My dad's dad had another friend who had a daughter about my age up for a ride in the truck, and unfortunately, had his way with her. My dad's dad was enabling him the whole time. I shudder to think what would have happened if my mom hadn't watched out for us. Yes, I believe that my dad's dad was in fact the same way that Ben was, not just an enabler. And I deep down think my dad absolutely knew. Now this was just conjecture, but... It was a common rumor in my community growing up that my dad's dad had in fact done terrible things to my aunt when she was a child. None of my family ever talked about it other than my mom who was a hero and would never let things go. She always asked my dad and he'd just say he didn't know and change the subject. The fact that he didn't immediately jump to defend his father against accusations that serious is an immediate red flag in my opinion. I now have no contact with my dad's dad or the rest of that side of the family and my life is much better for it. I'm traveling around the country in my car. I've been driving for over a week from the city I lived in and have so far slept in my car to save money. It wasn't until I got to a big enough city that I decided to treat myself to an actual bed that would be comfortable. I opted to choose an Airbnb because it's cheaper than hotels. I booked this Airbnb the day before I arrived to the city, so there weren't many options left. 
I had found this apartment on Airbnb that looked very new and modern and it was in a great location. The price was decent for its location and it almost seemed too good to be true. The downfall was that it was listed as a new listing and had zero reviews. I figured that the price was low because it was a new listing and decided to give it a shot. Must be legit because it's Airbnb, right? When I got to the apartment building, it was older looking than I expected. I later found out and realized that my Airbnb was most likely the only renovated apartment in the building and the building seemed to be in poor condition. It looked more like a dorm hall rather than an apartment building. Anyways, I let it all slide because I wasn't paying too much attention, so what could I expect? The apartment itself looked like the pics, so that was good enough. Everything went well for the first two days. As a female traveling alone, I always make sure to be safe. I don't go out when it's dark and I always lock the door. Every single lock, including the chain thing. Anyways, on the third day, I was out all morning and came back to the apartment to change to head to the beach. I had again locked the door, including the chain. I was in front of the door watching TV while changing when the door suddenly unlocks and someone opens the door. I'm beyond lucky that I had put the chain lock on the door or else it would have opened all the way. I was naked and no one else was supposed to have the keys. My first reaction was, Excuse me? And I closed the door right away, locking it again. I came from the back of the door and did not look or see who was opening it. I sat in front of the door scared and shocked, realized that this person could technically still get in here since they obviously have the keys to the apartment. At first I thought maybe it was the owner coming back after I checked out, but I was not supposed to check out until the following day, so it wasn't possible. After crying for a few minutes, I recuperated myself and called the owner and told her what had happened. She told me that no one else should have a set of keys other than her and I, and that she's at work and it wasn't her. I was scared to stay in that apartment because someone could come in. I didn't want to leave because I had all my valuables there. It was a lose-lose situation. I then called my dad who told me that it was not okay that someone has the keys and that she needs to take care of this ASAP. So we talked to her and she told me that she will be there shortly with a locksmith to change it and give me a pair of new keys. She then proceeded to tell me that she had only had this apartment for six months and that before I stayed there, there was only one other Airbnb booking. She also mentioned that it had been sitting empty other than those two bookings because she had been renovating the apartment, which now makes sense why the building looks like absolute trash and doesn't match the apartment. She told me that the only possibility for who that was could be the previous owners or someone related to them, but isn't that illegal? That possibility in theory really messed with me. How is it possible that I was gone all day every day and the ten minutes I was home during the daytime, someone just tries to barge in? Did they know I was there? What were they coming in for? If this apartment has been sitting empty for half a year, maybe they did this frequently. Or maybe they saw me coming in and tried to do something to me. These questions are constantly on my mind. I just know I'm lucky that I put that keychain on the door or else. I don't even want to know what else could happen. Needless to say, I won't be leaving a good review and I won't be staying in that Airbnb that has no reviews or seems potentially too good to be true. I live in Finland in a fairly small city and this happened to me a year ago when I was 14. So it was Friday evening and on every Friday our mom lets us go to the store and buy candy. So me and my 12 year old sister left our house to go to the store and it was already dark outside. We made our way to the closest store which was over a mile away. While walking at some point there's a man behind us walking the same way but I didn't think much about it at the time. He could just be going to the same store. So I continue chatting with my sister while the man is behind us following at a safe distance. We get to the store with no complications and the man followed us into the store. We take our time selecting our candy and get to the register to pay. While I was packing the candy into my backpack I saw this man buying only a chocolate bar. Pretty far away to go for a chocolate bar I thought and at this point my suspicions start to rise for this guy. I get out of the store with my sister and start making our way back. 
We walked for a while and I quickly glanced at my back and the man was still there following us. I took a look at my sister who seemed totally unaware about the man's presence. We continued our walk and up ahead of us was an unlit dirt road that continued for a good part of the trip so I look at my back again and there's the man still about 60 feet away. At this point I was almost certain that he was following us because on our way to the store he didn't walk this part of the way behind us. The dirt road goes through a forest and it had a curve at the start of it. Once we get to the curve I look back and notice that the man can't see us so I pull my sister into the woods and we duck down behind some brush. My sister is saying something and I just whisper to stay quiet to her as I wait for the man to come. I could see the man's shadow coming down the road and he stopped and started looking for us from the road. He walked back and forth and now I was certain that he was following us that entire time. My heart was racing and I tried to be as quiet as possible. Thankfully this man didn't find us but continued running forwards. We stayed in the forest for a while before getting the courage to come out. We walked the rest of the way home with no problems and get to our house. We eat our candy and have a good evening but it really did bother me for a while and especially my sister. Thinking about this still gives me the chills and the thought of getting caught in that situation again creeps me out and I really try not to think about it. Okay, so this happened when I was around nine years old, and it's something I will never forget. It gives me goosebumps to this day. I live in a terraced house, which are four houses combined, and my neighbors and I each have our own little patio. There's a small road 10 meters from my yard where people do their Sunday walks and so on. Only a small fence separates my small yard and patio from that road. I live in a pretty crowded area, with several of these terraced houses spread around in my neighborhood. So seeing people walking on that road is pretty normal for me. Seeing random people standing on my patio is not. When I was nine years old, I usually got home from school about an hour before my mom got home from work. I live maybe 50 meters away from school so my mom figured I was mature enough to be home alone for around an hour before she got home. This one day I got home from school, I did the usual thing, which was to make sure I locked the front door and double check that the back door leading to the patio was also locked. I then rushed to my room upstairs to play as much PlayStation as possible before my mom came home and made me do homework. While playing, I heard this noise coming from outside my window. My room was located one floor over the patio with a view to the road. It was kind of like the sound of a cat, but my cat had been missing for over three months. Hope sparked and I thought, Oh my god, did he finally come back? I ran downstairs to check if it was my cat, but the sight that met me gives me goosebumps just writing this. There was a guy standing on my patio, a tall guy with black hair covering half of his eyes, making him look like a male version of the ring woman or something. I could hear him making high-pitched sounds, almost like a cat meowing. A brown liquid was running down from his mouth, and I could see him spitting out my dad's stumped cigarettes. He was actually eating from the ashtray. I was frozen observing this, eventually snapped out of it, and screamed so loud that the man must have heard it. He didn't react. He kept on eating from the ashtray. I ran upstairs to my room, locked the door, and called my mom who then called the cops. I've never been more terrified in my life, lying in bed under my sheets, shivering with fear, as I hear these creepy, high-pitched noises from the guy eating cigarette stumps from the ashtray on my patio. I kind of blacked out for a moment, 
because the next thing I remember is the police arriving on the road by my yard. I hear them talking to the guy saying stuff like, what are you doing? Get over here or we'll come down and arrest you. And so on. He didn't respond. But the high pitched sounds were more frequent and louder. I decided to look through the window, feeling safe now that the cops were there. I could see two police officers standing by my fence, one man and one woman. I did not see the creepy man, however, because he was standing directly one story under me and my field of view. The police jumped the fence, and I remember hearing the creepy guy screaming louder than anything I've ever heard before. He charged the female police officer with full force and he knocked her out cold. The male officer then immediately tased the guy, leaving him shaking on the ground, screaming still. The policeman struggled to keep him on the ground while putting handcuffs on him, but eventually made it. After a while, he managed to wake up the female police officer, who seemed to be badly hurt. He called for backup in an ambulance, and then he sees me standing in the window above him. The expression on my face must have been something else, because he just looked at me and said, I sure as hell hope you didn't see all that. And I started to cry. By this time, neighbors started to arrive wondering what the hell was going on. One of my neighbors, an elderly woman, made me come down and she took care of me until my mom came back home. The police took the creepy guy with them in the car and left. But before they left, they promised to come back and talk to us about what had happened. This is where the story takes an unexpected turn. The male police officer came back later that night and sat down with me and my mom to talk. He explained that the guy on my patio was actually diagnosed with severe autism. He had escaped a facility where mentally challenged people lived, located around five kilometers from where I live. He explained that the guy had been living in my house five years ago, but he had been forced to move when his mom, his only caretaker, died. The poor guy probably thought he would find his mom in my house. He missed the routines, and he missed living there with his mom. The police had to move him from the house that time five years ago, because he was extremely strong. This was the reason he reacted the way he did when the police came on this day. Still frightened, I told the police officer that he needed to make sure that this would never happen again. He promised it wouldn't. After a few sleepless nights, my life got back to normal. The years went by, and the guy didn't come back until one year ago. At this time, my mom and dad had moved out. I bought the house from them, and I'm still living there today. I was enjoying my morning coffee on the patio when I see this random guy stopping on the road by my fence. He just stands there, looking at me. I look at him and give him a nod. And then I hear the high-pitched noises. It's him! His hair had turned gray, but the high-pitched sounds he made made me realize it was him. My heart started racing and I instantly remembered the reason why he was back. I realized that he must have managed to escape again. Because I kept my cool a bit longer than when I was nine, I started to realize how sorry I felt for the guy. Sixteen years later, and he was back to look for his mom. I decided to carefully ask him if he wanted to come down to the patio. He instantly jumped the fence. I started to think he would knock me out like he did to that police officer, but he didn't. He smiled. He looked at me and smiled. I offered him to sit down. He didn't respond. I offered him to come inside, 
and he started laughing. So we went inside. His face lit up, pure joy. He was home. It reminded him of the life he had with his mom. It almost made me tear up. All of a sudden, he sat down on my couch, turned on my TV, and switched directly to the cartoons. I observed him for a while and he was just completely focused on the cartoons. I just wanted him to enjoy the moment, so I didn't say anything to him. I realized that I had to call the facility to let them know. The caretakers arrived 10 minutes later, and after a whole lot of convincing, he got back up, crying, and they went back to the facility. I called the facility two days later, and we made a deal. His name is Tom, and I now consider Tom my friend. Every Sunday from the day he returned, Tom and his caretakers visit me to watch cartoons. They say it's the highlight of his week, and it makes my heart warm. Now, for several years my thoughts were, let's not meet guy on the patio eating from the ashtray, and now my thoughts are, let's meet every Sunday to watch cartoons my friend Tom. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and get and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video and join a live stream to catch an invite to my Discord. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.